Bueno, buenas tardes nuevamente, gracias por estar aquí y gracias otra vez al profesor Jan Kriegel por acompañarnos eh, aquí en, la, en el posgrado de la, de la UNAM. Eh, ayer, después de su brillante charla sobre la teoría general de Keynes, a 80 años de haber salido publicada, eh, y el día de hoy eh, nos va a hablar sobre la reforma del sistema financiero internacional y las economías en desarrollo. Y bueno, para aquellos que no estuvieron el día de ayer, eh, el profesor Jan Kriegel, eh, de los abanderados poskeynesianos, eh, fue compañero de Jaime Minsky, actualmente es el director del de Instituto Levy de Economía el Instituto Levy de Economía, de Bar College, donde Jaime Minsky pasó sus últimos años trabajando ahí. Ellos de, realizan eh, en el mes de marzo, en abril, el, el seminario eh, anual de, sobre Minsky, sobre el análisis de coyuntura, la cuestión financiera, retomando el pensamiento de Minsky. Y eh, una cosa importante, sobre todo los estudiantes eh, cada verano hay eh, un, un curso de verano eh, donde eh, se resalta, se retoma el pensamiento de Minsky, participan diversos eh, economistas poskeynesianos. Eh, antes el seminario, este, el curso de verano se realizaba en la Universidad de Missouri, Kansas City, en los últimos años se ha venido realizando en el Instituto Levy, en Bar College, en Nueva York. Eh, ya están saturadas las inscripciones para el curso de ahora de, de junio, eh, pero eh, estar atentos a las siguientes programaciones. Eh, en esos cursos el Instituto Levy eh, financia la estadía de los estudiantes ahí, solamente hay que pagar el boleto de avión. Eh, varios estudiantes del posgrado han estado allá en diversos cursos de verano, y eh, bueno, aparte de, de ser el director de investigación del Instituto Levy, el profesor Kriegel es el director del posgrado de maestría eh, del Instituto Levy, que es sobre teoría y política económica. El profesor Jan Kriegel, lo señalaba ayer, fue economista en jefe de la UNTA por varios años, cuando la UNTA tenía muy buenos análisis, eh, muy buenos reportes de desarrollo económico. Y eh, le damos el uso de la palabra al profesor Jan Kriegel. Thank you, Arturo. The theme that I've picked for today is one that will deal with a current problem, an actual problem, by looking at some historical propositions that have been largely forgotten basically, I think, because we have largely forgotten our basic economic theory. So, what I'm going to present to you today is something that any of you could have discovered quite easily if you had looked critically at the international financial system. Currently, the IMF is subject to requests from several developing countries for reform. For reform because of problems of unequal representation of developing countries in the decision-making processes of the IMF. And more importantly, because the policies of the IMF in general have not tended to take into account the problems that are facing developing economies in a global economy with increasingly integrated financial markets. Now what I'm going to suggest is that the IMF from its very inception was an institution that not only did not take into account the needs of developing countries, but in fact was set up on the basis 
of factors that were detrimental to economic development. And we're going to look at this in very simple terms. I start out with a series of what I call crib notes. These are the notes of what I think I'm going to be able to convince you of during the next hour. So we'll do this in summary. The first is that the Bretton Woods system was set up primarily to produce financial stability. Financial stability was defined as stable exchange rates. If a country is going to have a stable exchange rate, whether it's fixed or whether it is in some sense managed but remains stable, this necessarily implies that a country is in external equilibrium on its current account. Okay. Now, all of you, I'm sure, have learned your balance of payments accounting. And you know that the current account measures the claims of foreigners on your country and your claims on the rest of the world. Those claims are settled with foreign exchange transactions so that a current account deficit means that you are in a position of having to sell a currency that is not your own in order to stabilize your domestic currency. And a current account surplus means you have to sell your own currency in order to stabilize your exchange rate with the rest of the world. So that we take this as the basic principle behind the financial stability that was presumed to be created by the Bretton Woods system. Now, as I say, the problem here is the way we view the conditions. If we look at it from the point of view of financial stability, it appears to be something that is very positive. In particular, against the background of the 1920s and the 1930s, where exchange rates were extremely volatile and countries used exchange rates in order to benefit their domestic exports by engaging in what was called competitive devaluation, the idea of introducing financial stability was considered to be a positive benefit for the global economy. What I'm going to suggest is that this positive benefit for the global economy was in fact detrimental to the development strategies that were being proposed by international multilateral financial institutions for developing countries. The second point is that it is quite normal for us to consider the exchange rate as being a single price, a single variable. And the decisions taken at the Bretton Woods system were decisions that required members of the IMF to introduce a single exchange rate policy. That is, you have one exchange rate for all transactions. Initially, the IMF covered basically commercial transactions, what we call current account transactions. So the second point that we like to make is that implicitly, the IMF presumed that countries would have single exchange rates. I already mentioned that I was going to use a certain amount of historical theory in the presentation. And this comes in in the discussion of single exchange rates because it was quite common in the 1940s, the 1950s, and the 1960s for economists to recommend multiple exchange rates as being a fundamentally important factor in the development of a manufacturing or industrial sector in developing economies. And I think you're all familiar with the work of Sipal and in particular Raoul Prebisch and other development economists who argued very strongly in favor of building up a strong manufacturing sector 
in order to allow developing economies to emerge from primary commodity export dependence. And the argument here was that multiple exchange rates were in fact a crucial factor in this process. So implicitly, the decision to accept an international financial system with a single exchange rate meant that developing countries were giving up a very important policy tool in their development strategy in providing a more balanced structure of their domestic production system and in particular a more balanced structure of exports. Finally, the third point is the use of the US dollar as a peg or settlement currency for both the current account and capital account. This morning we probably will not have a great deal of time to talk about the role of the dollar in the international system, but this is a third point in which there is a great deal of discussion about reform of the system and that reform is basically arguing in favor of replacing the dollar with some other international standard, something like the special drawing right or some other national currency. Here, the decision to adopt the dollar and the decision that a normal international settlement system would require an international currency also goes diametrically opposed to the proposals that Keynes himself had made in order to provide not only developing countries but also those countries recovering from the Second World War of the kind of domestic policy space which would have allowed them to pursue policies to maximize employment and to maximize growth. So these are the basic three factors that I'm going to suggest that characterize the international financial system and that if we are going to talk about fundamental reform of that system, the reform has to come in these three areas rather than simply increasing the representation of developing countries on the boards of the IMF or the World Bank or changing the quotas that are available to developing countries. So this is our basic summary and we can start out with the proposition that the Bretton Woods system created what I called conflicting objectives. I sometimes like to call this cognitive dissonance. If you're aware of this psychological term, cognitive dissonance means that you are capable of adopting two diametrically opposed positions at the same time without recognizing that they conflict with each other, without recognizing that you cannot in fact achieve both of those positions at the same time. In the case of cognitive dissonance, it's the case that you cannot believe both of those positions at the same time. As we said, the first was that the system was to produce multilateral exchange rate stability based, as we said, on this $35 peg to the US dollar. The second objective was that developed countries had a responsibility to adopt policies to aid developing countries. And in very simple terms, those policies were based on what we call the net transfer of resources from developed to developing economies in open capital markets. Even today, if you look at the specific title of the Development Co Committee of the World Bank, the Development Committee's official title is the Interministerial Committee for the Transfer of Resources from Developed to Developing Countries. Now, if we look at these two factors 
in detail. Exchange rate stability requires that first there will be negligible capital flows in private markets. And this was a basic presumption of the creation of the Bretton Woods system. If you look at the statement of U.S. Treasury Secretary Morgenthau, he said, we want an international financial system that drives the private financial market traders from international finance. We want to eliminate private bank financial transfers. Second, as we've already said, if you're going to have a stable exchange rate, the Bretton Woods system was effectively a fixed exchange rate system, it meant that you had to intervene in your foreign exchange market whenever your country's demand for foreign currency was greater than the supply of foreign currency. Now, representing this in terms of supply and demand for foreign currency can also be represented in terms of your current account balance. That is, a current account surplus or a current account deficit will generate excess demands or excess supplies of your domestic currency that would disturb the fixed exchange rate. So that on balance, if you were going to have a stable exchange rate, it meant that on balance, on trend, over time, your current account balance would be in equilibrium, which means that basically you would be exporting as much to the rest of the world as you were importing to the rest of the world. Minor fluctuations would be met by your holdings of foreign currency reserves, implicitly holdings of US dollars because your currency was pegged to the US dollar, so that the maximum current account deficit you could run was determined by the size of your foreign exchange holdings in US dollars. If you went beyond this limit, the IMF was there to provide you a loan of US dollars in order to keep your exchange rate stable, but this loan was provided on the condition that you introduce policies to bring your external accounts back into balance. That is, you would have to eliminate your external deficit. And in fact, you would have to run an external surplus in order to repay the funds to the IMF. So in general, if you were a member of the IMF and you had agreed to keep your exchange rate stable relative to the dollar, it meant that on balance your current account would be in equilibrium over time. Now if we take the second objective of the post-war system, dealing with developing countries, as we've already said, the idea was that there would be positive net resource flows. Developed countries would have current account surpluses and developing countries, developed countries would have current account surpluses and developing countries would be importing the goods and services, in particular imports of capital goods, in order to build up their domestic economy. So implicitly, if we are going to have a development structure that is based on the net transfer of resources, it means that development requires developing countries to have current account deficits and developed countries to have current account surpluses. So that this is in direct contradiction to the basic premise of stability that was built into the Bretton Woods system. A developing country that happened to grow reasonably rapidly and in general rapid rates of growth meant large and increasing current account deficits, the response of the IMF would be to tell the country, sorry, you are developing too rapidly. 
because your current account is in deficit and your exchange rate will come under pressure. So the IMF would arrive and introduce policies to restrict your imports of capital goods, to restrict your domestic rate of growth, and to restrict your speed of development. So that you have this direct contradiction to the policies that we were recommending to developing countries and the policies that were required for stability of the international financial system. This is not a problem that is simply, uh, can be simply applied to developing countries in Latin America. It also applies to developing countries in, for example, the European Union. Ireland, inside the European Union, was for many years an underdeveloped economy compared to the rest of Europe. In the 1990s, already beginning in the 1980s, Ireland started growing extremely rapidly. And the European Commission noted that Ireland was building up a very large external deficit as well as a fiscal deficit. And what did they recommend to Ireland? They said, sorry, you are improving the per capita income of your citizens too rapidly. You are being too successful in your development strategy. You should introduce policies in order to reduce your rate of growth and return your fiscal and external balances to equilibrium. So it's a very general problem. That is, any country that happens to run a development strategy that produces very large external imbalances automatically is considered to be creating destabilizing international financial conditions. We don't now have to look at the case of China that has adopted the opposite policy, that is a policy of export expansion, and we see that the United States government continually asks China to reduce its external surplus because China is developing too rapidly. So the first point that we want to make is that within this very simple concept of international financial stability, of exchange rate stability, implicitly we are placing limits on the ability of developing countries to use this development strategy of their choice in order to maximize the rate of development and their rate of convergence with developed economies. <coughs> the next point is the point of external adjustment and the use of exchange rates. Under the IMF system, if it is impossible for the IMF to introduce policies to a country to return it to external equilibrium by means of domestic policies to reduce the rate of expansion, the fallback policy is the policy of an exchange rate adjustment, basically a devaluation on the presumption that a devaluation will provide the adjustment to the current account imbalance. Now, we know if we study international trade and finance that changes in exchange rates produce a return to balance under very precise conditions of elasticity. As an aside, we note that these Marshall Lerner conditions are conditions which are applied if you paid attention when you were being taught them, are being applied in general to an initial state of equilibrium, not an initial state of disequilibrium. And in general, it has been the case that when countries have attempted to use exchange rate adjustments to return to equilibrium on their external balance, we had to invent a term to explain why they didn't work. I'm sure you have all heard of the J-curve. The J-curve is an explanation of why 
a devaluation in a developing country may produce a worsening of its external balance rather than an improvement in an external balance. And basically, the simple explanation is that most developing countries facing a dominance of primary commodities in their export basket simply do not come anywhere close to meeting the elasticity conditions that would be required for this type of adjustment. And indeed, if we look at one of Prebish's explanations of the problem facing developing countries in the terms of trade, or the tendency to the decline in the terms of trade over time, was precisely in terms of identifying the elasticity conditions facing the exports of developing countries. In particular, the elasticity condi income and price elasticity conditions facing primary commodity exports. So we have this, again, basic difficulty that the policies that were required for international financial stability and participation in the international system required an external balance that remained in equilibrium, that limited the rate of development of a developing economy. And if this could not be met, required a policy of exchange rate adjustment that was completely inapplicable to the production structure of developing countries. So that if we look, basically the international financial system and the economic development systems were contradictory. And the argument which I'm attempting to make is that the participation, the continued participation of developing countries and the dissatisfaction of developing countries with the way they are treated by the international financial institutions is basically determined by these fundamental factors which are not supportive but are detrimental to the development process. Now, if we look at the external adjustment and external debt, the second factor, which is extremely important, is that the use of international financial transfers as the basis for economic development, to the extent that it was not corrected, led to the secondary problem of the accumulation of international debt denominated in a foreign currency for most developing countries. That is, if we believe your development strategy has to be based on external financing, that is, borrowing from abroad in order to finance your current account deficit, by definition, this means that you are going to be accumulating an increasing stock of debt in a foreign currency. Now, as long as these transfers are grants from developed to developing countries, or transfers made under conditions that are very advantageous, that is, non-market conditions, this problem is not particularly difficult. In fact, if we look at the discussions of international financial transfers for development in the 1950s, the presumption was that these would be basically grants. That is, this was money that did not have to be repaid. If indeed it was money that was made by official transfers at official rates, that it would be primarily made through the international financial institutions. That is, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development was supposed to be the channel by which funds were moved from developed to developing countries. Unfortunately, this never occurred and by the time the Bretton Woods system collapsed in the 1970s, virtually all financial transfers were private market financial transfers at private market 
interest rates. So that a development strategy which was based by foreign borrowing not only met the difficulty of limitations from the international financial institutions, but they now became limited by the willingness of international capital markets to make financial transfers which are sufficient to cover the current account deficits. And basically, this shift to private market financing of current account deficits, we saw very clearly at the end of the 1970s and the default at the beginning of the 1980s of Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, and most Latin American economies that had used private financing in order to cover their current account deficits. But this time, it was not the IMF that came in and said you have to introduce domestic policies in order to reduce your external imbalances. It was now the international financial institutions who said we will no longer lend to you to finance those imbalances and we want our money back. And this generated the increasingly frequent financial crises that took place throughout the 1980s, the 1990s, and the early 2000s in most developing countries that had adopted this strategy of financing development by means of external capital inflows. Now, I want to go back and look at the idea of exchange rates and external adjustment and external debt. In both the system in which the IMF placed limits on current account deficits by means of conditional program policies and the subsequent period in which international private financial institutions provided the current account financing, it was presumed that exchange rate adjustment would produce equilibrium. It was either a forced adjustment by the IMF requiring the country to devalue, or it was the forced adjustment from the international financial crisis, which produced a domestic financial crisis and a domestic exchange rate crisis. In both of these cases, it is presumed that the adjustment of the single exchange rate was sufficient to bring about a return to equilibrium. If we look, I mentioned at the historical record of development policy, the early economists who dealt with development issues, in particular what we could call the development pioneers, and here we're talking about people like Prebisch, Diamant, Nicholas Kaldor, Rosenstein, Rodin, uh, Ragnar Nurkse, and others. They recognized that there was a basic conflict between the exchange rate that was appropriate to the policy of building up an industrial sector to provide a balance to the primary commodity export sector. Prebisch always argued that the way to emerge from primary commodity dependence was to build up a manufacturing sector that would compete in foreign markets and to create export earnings that could be used in order to finance the imports of the required capital goods from developed countries. Marcel Diamant is an Argentinian economist. In fact, he was not an economist, he was an engineer. You'll notice that oftentimes people who are not economists understand problems of economics much more rapidly than economists do. Diamant developed a theory of what he called the unbalanced productive structure. In simple terms, a developing economy that starts with a primary commodity dependence and attempts to industrialize 
has what Diamant calls an unbalanced productive structure. The primary commodity sector is dominant and the manufacturing sector is subordinate. Now, it's subordinate in two ways. First of all, the primary commodity sector is usually more advanced and more productive than the manufacturing sector because, in fact, it has been created by foreign investment and foreign investors as a market to supply developed commodity markets. On the other hand, manufacturing exports in general will be less competitive because the industry is simply starting out. It is competing with the developed country manufacturers. So that Diamand argues that if you have an unbalanced productive structure and you have a single exchange rate and if your primary commodity sector dominates your export basket, that the exchange rate that will be set up, that will be determined by the market, will be one that balances imports and exports in the primary commodity sector rather than the one that would balance the manufacturing sector. So what he argues is that in these cases, a single exchange rate will be detrimental to the ability to build up a strong manufacturing sector which is able to compete in international export markets. Okay? What would be the ideal policy? Well, obviously the ideal policy, argues Diamand, would be to have one exchange rate for the agricultural or the primary commodity sector and a separate exchange rate for the manufacturing sector. If the single exchange rate is overvalued relative to the needs of the manufacturing sector, it would be appropriate to have an exchange rate that is higher for manufacturing than the exchange rate that you use for primary commodities. Nicholas Caldor, who was an eminent Keynesian economist in Cambridge and worked frequently as an advisor to developing countries, in particular to Cipal, had a very similar position. For Calder, the basic problem facing developing countries was the inability to produce manufactured goods at levels of cost and productivity that would allow them to become competitive in international markets. Now, I should put a parenthesis here. For those of you who have been taught that the approach of Sipal and others has simply been import substitution industrialization, I would like to recommend that you read very closely the work of Raoul Prebisch, Nicholas Caldor, and Marcel Diamand. The objective was not to build up a manufacturing sector to substitute imports. Their argument was that you built up a manufacturing sector in order to sell exports in international markets in order to generate the foreign earnings that would allow you to pay for the imports that you required for development. In Prebish's phrase to the first UNCTAD conference, he said, we do not want to borrow our way to development, we want to be able to earn our way to development. And this meant opening manufactured goods markets in developed countries to allow developing countries to build up manufacturing and to sell exports in those markets. Now, as Calder then goes on to argue, when import requirements exceed the capacity to export on account of high domestic costs, this is because the exchange rate, which would make it possible for an underdeveloped country to develop export markets in manufactured products, would mean a considerable undervaluation of its currency in terms of primary commodities. As I said, you want a higher exchange rate for your manufactured goods than you do for your primary commodity exports. And when I say higher, I mean domestic currency 
relative to foreign currency. Okay? Back to Diamant, exchange rate policy and industrialization. Diamant always argued that developing countries really did not lack foreign savings to development. What they lacked was an ability to generate foreign exchange earnings in order to finance their development. Countries whose primary production is faced with limitations by world demand should concentrate upon industrial exports. They must take into account the obstacles to these exports are in the pattern of exchange rates habitually used by them. That is, in the existence of a single exchange rate. Diamant offers an additional explanation to the lack of foreign demand for exports for the failure of rising industrial productivity to pass through to higher demand and domestic wages. The failure of the exchange rate to offset the high costs of production in the industrial sector. So that if we look at the kind of exchange rate policy that was being recommended in the 1950s, the 1960s, and the 1970s, it is diametrically opposed to the IMF requirement for a single exchange rate for developing countries. Instead of operating on the overall exchange rate, the first measure should consist in restructuring the industrial exchange rate for exports. We would then have two basic exchange rates, the nominal rate representing a more expensive dollar for financial transactions, industrial exports, and with the corresponding import duties much lower than in the conventional system also for imports. On the other hand, we would have the primary exchange rate for primary goods exports determined by the nominal rate less export duties. This reform would bring the nominal exchange rate substantially closer to the structure of industrial costs and would improve the possibility to export manufactured goods. This is Diamant. Another alternative or complementary procedure would be simply to build up a de facto exchange system for exports with tax reimbursements and other fiscal stimuli. Now, it's important to note that membership in the IMF and the WTO forbids developing countries from introducing any of these particular policies. Nicholas Caldor reaches exactly the same conclusion. There is no single rate of exchange which is capable of securing equilibrium between domestic costs of production and the prices or the level of costs in foreign markets. Similar to Diamand, there is no way out of this dilemma except by some system of dual exchange rates or some system of combined taxes and subsidies which produce the same effects as dual exchange rates. Those of you who are familiar with Argentinian history, you will note that Argentina has used in the past dual exchange rates or multiple exchange rates. And recently, Argentina had a well-defined system of taxes and subsidies on exports and imports. You will also note that the new government has recently freed the exchange rate and removed all of these subsidies, which has produced a very sharp increase in primary foodstuffs sold in the domestic market at the same time, it has provided a very large increase in the domestic earnings of primary commodity exporters. That is, a net transfer from domestic purchasing power, which might be used to support domestic manufacturing, to the producers of primary commodities. That is, a change in relative prices, which gives a very substantial advantage to primary commodity producers relative to manufacturing producers. Exactly the opposite of the kinds of policies that are being recommended. The final point that I'm going to deal with is the use of exchange rate depreciation. So we've already established that a stable exchange rate 
is detrimental to developing countries, that a single exchange rate prevents developing countries from using the exchange rate as a tool to support the development of a manufacturing sector, we now want to look at the use of exchange rate adjustment as a tool to produce equilibrium. Again, Nicholas Caldor, he notes that while developing countries, in developing countries, a shortfall of exports is generally taken as evidence of overvaluation of the currency, it is essential to understand that it is not the kind of overvaluation that could be cured by any uniform adjustment of the exchange rate. That is, if the overvaluation is relative to the manufacturing sector, it means that exchange rate adjustment cannot eliminate this factor. Since primary commodities form the great bulk of its exports, the rise in export proceeds in the primary sector, which follows the devaluation, tends to generate an inflation in domestic costs and prices that soon neutralizes any initially beneficial effects on the export costs of manufacturers. The rise in the domestic price of export crops is bound, sooner or later, to lead to a corresponding rise in the local prices of food. We saw this very clearly in Argentina in 2001 and 2002, and in December of this year, we saw that domestic prices rose before the exchange rate adjustment even took place. Since the levels of income characteristic of underdeveloped countries, money wages in industry will be closely correlated to the price of food, a rise in earnings from primary exports will tend to bring about a corresponding advance in the level of money costs in manufacturing production. Again, if we take the current case of Argentina in the Paritarias, the government is offering wage increases of 20 to 25 percent, Currency inflation is around 35% and the unions say that they will settle for around 40%, which means that any benefit that might have come from the devaluation to manufactured exporters will be instantly eliminated by the rise in wage costs so that the devaluation does not provide any relief to the, the overvaluation of the currency in the manufacturing sector. Calder goes on to note that the periodic efforts of the IMF to secure an alleviation of the balance of payments problems of particular underdeveloped countries by the introduction of more realistic exchange rates has proved to be so misguided. In most of these cases, devaluation has been followed by a new wave of inflation which has swallowed up the stimulus to exports afforded by the devaluation within a relatively short period. The diagnosis that has led to such recommendations has been based on the false analogy from the situation of industrialized countries whose export prices are cost determined to that of primary producers whose export costs are price determined. Okay? So basically we're saying that the IMF policy was designed for countries with a balanced productive structure. That is one in which it has an already developed manufacturing sector. Whereas in developing countries, when you're trying to expand manufacturing in order to generate additional exports to replace primary commodity exports, a devaluation does not provide any benefit to that policy. According to Diamand, the, the implementation of these policies by some developing countries has been ad hoc and improvised, arrived at under the pressure of circumstances not within the framework of an integrating paradigm adopted without predict conviction, badly qualified and incoherent. These measures do not suffice to counteract the basic trend towards foreign deficit and indebtedness that leads to the necessity of continuing foreign aid either as a refinancing operation or as new loans. Here what Diamand is arguing is that in general, if a devaluation does not provide any expansion in exports, the only thing that happens is that you end up with an inflation 
which then leads to an additional recommendation to adjust the exchange rate in order to offset the real appreciation that occurs in the currency. So the IMF simply comes back again and says, you have to re devalue your currency once more. As a result, countries have been forced to appeal for financing to the IMF, which conditions assistance to the adoption of well-known IMF stabilization plans, devaluation, monetary restriction, the elimination of the budget deficits financed by monetary issue, wage freezes, rebates in tariff protection, removal of exchange controls, and the dismantling of multiple exchange rates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that if we look at, in sum, the way membership in the IMF impacts developing countries, we can say the problem is not only in the fact that the IMF in general introduces conditions on program loans to developing countries that are detrimental to developing countries. It is the basic fundamental principles of financial stability and single exchange rates and the use of exchange rate devaluation to provide that stability which is in fact mistaken. Now, the question is, how do we get out of this mess? And this is a quotation from Diamand. In the education and training of macroeconomists, there is an implicit assumption either of a balance of payments equilibrium or of a temporary disequilibrium which in e can easily be solved by the adequate management of exchange rates. But Diamand argues that these conditions are precisely the conditions that do not apply in developing countries. And in fact, these are the conditions that should not apply in developing countries if they are going to be expanding their manufacturing base and if they are going to be increasing per capita incomes. The recommendations of Diamand, Caldor, and others for the problem of competitive exports of manufacturers from developing countries has never been implemented aside from the hesitant and half-hearted attempts driven by emergency conditions noted by Diamand. He said, yes, every once in a while we introduce some of these measures, but they're never part of a well-thought-out, fundamental, supported strategy. If we think of European countries, for those people who argue that dual exchange rates are impossible, European countries practice capital controls and or dual exchange rates until the end of the 1980s with relative success. Belgium gave up its dual exchange rate system only under protest. Belgium had a very effective system of a financial sector exchange rate and a commercial account exchange rate. Use of the financial ex sector exchange rate was a very, a very efficient tool in managing capital inflows and capital outflows into the Belgian economy, which was extremely well. It has also been argued that exchange rate differentiation would be too difficult to implement. Well, we have now been convinced that it's possible to introduce financial transactions taxes and indeed the major European developed economies are arguing in favor of financial transactions taxes so that if it is possible to identify financial transactions and tax them it should also be possible to entertain the possibility of reintroducing dual exchange rate or multiple exchange rate policies. The impact on developing countries would be appreciably more positive than any transfer of resources generated by the transactions tax and more importantly it would allow developing countries to earn their development financing rather than having to depend on external finance or charity to finance the construction of a competitive manufacturing or industrial sector. Since we've got to the hour, we'll leave the problem of the dollar at the peg in the system out of this and simply finish with the observation 
that the IMF system and financial stability, as it is currently conceived, is conceived in such a way that it does not support the kinds of policies that would allow developing countries to pursue alternative development strategies and policies that would allow them to pursue active creation and support for domestic industrialization, industrialization policies which will allow them to compete in export markets competitively. For those who argue that it cannot be done, we have in front of us the examples of Korea, Malaysia, Taiwan, China, and a range of Asian economies. Indeed, Alice Amsden, shortly before she died, produced an article which had as its title something to the equivalent of Rao Prebish is alive and well and living in Asia. She believed that the Asian export policies were exactly the kinds of policies that Prebish believed that Latin American countries should be following in terms of their export strategies. Membership in the IMF and the WTO and various bilateral and regional multilateral trading agreements prevent developing countries from doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Bueno, pasamos a la ronda de comentarios y preguntas. Pueden hacer las preguntas en español. El profesor Kriegel entiende perfectamente el español. Sí. Sí, gracias. Eh, me parece excelente la presentación y la problemática que se plantea. Y creo que sí, Raúl Previch, efectivamente, pues tenía y tiene razón. Pero mi pregunta es si se, si se puede hacer algo tomando en cuenta el número de tratados de libre comercio que están realizando muchos países subdesarrollados y en el caso de México, bueno, pues es uno de los líderes en tratados de libre comercio. Entonces la pregunta es esta, si se puede adoptar una política de desarrollo, pero ahora con estos tratados creo que ahí hay muchos problemas, inclusive ahora con el acuerdo reciente del Transpacífico. Gracias. Eh, en, en la misma dirección de lo que él mencionaba, eh, no solo son los tratados de libre comercio, sino hay un proceso de liberalización multilateral, unilateral, regional, <ríe> y los tratados, y también un proceso de liberalización de los flujos internacionales de capital, ¿verdad? que está contenido en, en los mismos tratados, tienen algunas cláusulas, y que es un proceso que viene desde desde los 70, ¿verdad? Eh, o muy fuerte desde los 70, entonces en ese marco, o sea, con liberalización del comercio de bienes, liberalización de los movimientos de capital y financiero, eh, si es posible hacer eh, como estrategias de desarrollo en la perspectiva, digamos, keynesiana. Sobre todo pienso que, digamos, el, el caso de China tal vez sería un contraejemplo, porque hay muchas eh, normativas las cuales o las han adoptado tarde o no las han adoptado, ¿verdad? por ejemplo los procesos de ajuste, la condicionalidad para abrir sus economías, entonces más bien son, yo diría que es como la excepción que puede confirmar, 
que confirma la regla. O sea, yo veo, por eso, eh, como muy difícil implementar en, liber, con liberalización de comercio, liberalización de capital, una estrategia de desarrollo. Pero bueno, me gustaría su opinión. Hola, Jan. <coughs> Las estrategias de desarrollo y de política económica han cambiado de los ochentas a la fecha, en los países latinoamericanos y en todo el mundo, y una de las estrategias de industrialización o de crecimiento económico en México ha cambiado prácticamente todo el panorama para el caso de la economía mexicana, en la actualidad no hay o no se reconoce oficialmente una política industrial, eh, por un lado y por la otra, eh, hay una, algo que comentaba sobre la, la pérdida que ha tenido la relación países eh, prestamistas y países eh, prestatarios o, o endeudados, eh, ha cambiado y esto con sus efectos eh, claros en, la, en, la, en el manejo de la política monetaria para controlar la inflación, y eh, mantener un tipo de cambio relativamente estable. Aquí se presenta un fenómeno que también ha ocurrido a nivel internacional, sobre todo para los países deudores, que es el, de, el incremento de las reservas internacionales. Este incremento de las reservas internacionales eh, ha, ha, eh, ha permitido tener un margen de manejo en el… En el control del tipo de cambio, eh, ¿cuál, ¿cuál es tu, tu, tu opinión en este sentido? Eh, ya no está siendo utilizada la, la, los, las divisas para inversión extranjera, eh, para inversión directa o, o productiva, ahora está siendo utilizada para eh, mantener un tipo de cambio relativamente estable. ¿Cuál es tu, tu opinión al respecto? Porque no, no aparece ni en Diamond ni en, ni en Caldor, ¿no? Gracias. Yo tengo una… En relación a la, a la situación presente en México, América Latina, eh, tú, tú bien señalaste en tu exposición cómo la política de desarrollo está basada en el endeudamiento externo, es decir, no solamente yo diría en el endeudamiento externo, sino en las variables externas exportaciones, alto precio de las materias primas, del petróleo, entrada de capitales y actualmente todas esas variables están actuando de forma negativa. Entonces tuvimos señalas la dificultad de las medidas para ajustar el déficit del sector externo y el problema de endeudamiento. Es decir, cómo nuestros países o sea, instrumentan políticas defensivas, o sea, contracción de gasto, aumento de tasa de interés, eh, para que el capital no se vaya o para frenar la actividad económica y así disminuir las presiones de demanda, pero esas políticas te vienen a incrementar los problemas de oferta, los problemas estructurales que están detrás del déficit eh, del sector externo. Eh, y la perspectiva es que las variables externas sigan actuando de forma negativa, no, no sé por cuántos meses o años. Eh, y entonces, por lo tanto, esas políticas, esta estabilidad financiera o estabilidad de la moneda que se sustentaba en, en la actuación positiva de las variables externas, pues ya no se va a dar ¿no? y no se va a resolver con estas políticas fiscales y monetarias restrictivas. Entonces, ¿qué, qué es lo que piensas? Ok, to start. What I really want people to understand is that everything I've said today, as I said before, you could have figured out yourselves, okay? Simply by looking at the conditions for stable exchange rates and understanding balance of payments accounts, okay? You did not have to be geniuses, you did not have to be Raul Prebish, you did not have to be Nicholas Kaldor. Anybody with any basic formation in economics, okay? should have been able to do this. 
Now, the question is, or at least the question that I find intriguing, is how is it possible that we manage to create an international financial system and to support it, okay, for over 50 years without recognizing, okay, that it was basically detrimental to developing countries, okay? Now, you have critics, okay? Prebish always argued the problems of center periphery and everything else, but this is something which is much simpler, okay? And my basic presumption is this sort of, it's this sort of a, a psychological problem, okay? Somehow or other, as Diamant pointed out, we have all been brainwashed to believe that the world normally is in equilibrium and that financial stability is a good thing. So we automatically accept that anything that produces financial stability is beneficial without questioning what are the costs of that financial stability and who gains the benefits of that stability. And it becomes quite clear if you look either historically or in terms of differentiation across countries that the industrialized countries depended on exchange rate stability for reconstruction after the war and they depended on exchange rate stability in order to develop their international markets. Now where were those international markets? Well, here we are. We're sitting in one of them. So it was not in the interest of any developed country okay, to introduce any changes in the international financial system okay, that was detrimental to that. The IMF originally was created not with the initial objective of exchange rate stability. It was the in initial objective of recreating a free multilateral trading system, okay? Now, if you think of this proposition at the point in time when it was introduced, you found that instantly economists said this is impossible. Why? Because the European economies had basically zero export capacity. So what happened? The IMF agreements were suspended for these countries. You had the process of martial aid from the United States building up of their export capacity, which they already had, so it's simply a question of rebuilding the existing capacity. And once they were back to their, what Diamant would call balanced productive structure, then the system started out. And nobody really paid very much attention to developing countries aside from the fact that they were not developing, and the response then was, well, if they're not developing, we'll give them some money, and that's going to solve the problem, without ever trying to match these two things together. So, I'm really not arguing that we can go out and do this tomorrow. I'm trying to say that if you had studied, these people had studied their economics appropriately, this could have been avoided, okay? Somebody brought up the case of China, okay? China was not originally part of the IMF. It was not originally part of the WTO, okay? It engaged in its own independent development strategy and only once it had built its manufacturing base, yes, then it went into the WTO, then it went into the IMF, and it said, we want representation in the IMF. So this gives you a very good example, if you like, of a very sensible strategy. Okay? The Chinese apparently recognized that there was a contradiction between these two things, and they produced their policy appropriately. As I mentioned, economists like Kaldor, Prebish, Nerksey, and all of the early development economists also recognized this problem. So if you ask the question, in the end, how did we get here, and partially this is uh, Arturo's question, how did we get here is this second part of the strategy, that is when we went to private financial markets and the use of private financial markets to finance the current account deficits of developing countries. 
because at that stage it meant that effectively countries had lost control over all of their domestic policy tools. You no longer had an exchange rate policy because financial flows in and out basically determined your exchange rate. You no longer had a domestic monetary policy because monetary creation was determined by what the foreign investors brought into the country or took out of the country. You no longer had a domestic demand policy because if you were going to keep some management of your exchange rate, the presumption was that you had to keep management over the price level. So your policy was always to keep demand below anything that was near to full capacity. Because if you didn't do so, inflation would disturb the exchange rate and disturbing the exchange rate would disturb the international investors. Okay? So, I said, we're in, a, we're in a system in which, now if you say, can we do this now? No, obviously we can't do this now. But it's important to recognize how we got here and it's important to recognize what we should do going forward. So, you brought up the question of the regional, multilateral, well, whatever they are, the bilateral, regional, multilateral trade agreements, which all of them have in them investment agreements, and those investment agreements say explicitly that the country no longer has control over its domestic production structure. Because if your capital markets are open, if your financial markets are open, your production structure is determined why f why by what foreign direct investment decides your productive structure is going to be. So you can either say, no, we don't want to do this, or you can sign the agreement and you end up with a permanently unbalanced productive structure, which if you try to change, you will be taken to arbitration court and the arbitration court will tell you that you can't do it because you've signed an agreement which says that a private company can sue a regional government or can sue the federal government and protect the interests of the private government before the interests of the domestic, of the domestic population. So this is the, the first part. Yes, I mean, I'm not arguing that we can go out and do this right away. What I'm arguing is that engaging in these sorts of agreements, okay, which look like they are beneficial, okay? If you say to anybody outside of a, uh, a developing country that's been through an IMF program, you say, you know, are you in favor of international financial instability? They go, oh no, absolutely not. We want international financial stability. Yes, of course we do. But the question is, how do you get it? There is a system of producing that stability which is more equitable to developing countries than the one that we currently have. So what sort of policies do you adopt? First of all, you don't sign the investment agreements in trade agreements, okay? Investment should have no part of these trade agreements. Secondly, you may not want to sign the trade agreements at all. Why? Because if you are trying to engage in a more balanced productive structure, then by definition, any sort of trade agreement prevents you from doing that. Prevents you from doing that, why? Because the trade agreements are supposedly an equitable quid pro quo, an opening of markets, okay? Now, equitable quid pro quo means that you take a first division football team and you allow it to play the last division football team. That's the equivalent of a level playing field in international trade and competition. When the United States government says, we want to move towards an external account that is in surplus, what does that mean? It means that Mexico is going to have a deficit. It means that China should have a deficit. Okay? So, when you're dealing with these things and you're attempting to do the negotiations, you have to identify where your national interests lie. And in general, national interests do not lie in terms of 
some idea of international cooperation or international stability or international uh, anything else. If we look at China, yeah, but China is, a, as I said, a very interesting example, okay? The counterexample to this is Europe, okay? The European Union and the single, the single European currency. They moved first to financial integration with countries at very different levels of productivity, very different productive structures. What happened? Well, we've seen what's happened to Greece, what's happened to Portugal, what is likely to happen to France and Italy. Okay? They got the timing backwards. China did the timing the other way. First you start with closed capital markets. You start with a carefully managed exchange rate. You start with a carefully managed domestic manufacturing sector. You start with an undervalued exchange rate and you then produce the manufacturing sector which allows you to compete. Okay? So it's very clearly a question of timing. Europe got it wrong, China got it right. Unfortunately, most developing countries get it wrong because they don't recognize that participation in these agreements is in fact detrimental to their conditions. So. If you go to an international trade agreement and the international trade agreement says you have to do this and this, you say, what is the impact of this on my domestic development strategy? Does it give me leeway or does it not give me leeway? And the response that is always given is, well, it's, your in, it's in your interest to do this because it opens your economy to foreign investment. Okay? There is no economy that I know of, aside from Malaysia, that has managed a successful development strategy on the basis of foreign direct investment. Not one. Okay. After Malaysia, the next best is China, and this was not a policy of open foreign direct investment. This was a policy of managed foreign direct investment and majority participation for Chinese companies in every one of the joint ventures. Okay? There is no foreign direct invest investor in China that has the majority control of any of the operations of foreign direct investment. It remains under the control of the Chinese government. Okay? So this argument which says we have to open, well, the current Argentinian government said we are, we are going to return to the the normal world of international capital markets and we are going to be able to borrow. And I say, yes, you're going to be able to borrow. This is going to generate overvaluation of the exchange rate, you're going to impoverish your population, and eventually you're going to have to pay the money back. How are you going to pay it back? Are you going to pay it back with export exports? No. Are you going to pay it back with soybeans? Maybe if the price of soybeans recovers. But how much employment can you produce by an economy that is specialized in exporting soybeans? Simply not viable, not feasible. So this is really not a, as I say, it's not a question. I'm not saying that you know, we should go out tomorrow and introduce dual exchange rates. On the other hand, Argentina had a system, the system of retenciones, which is a very close equivalent of using taxes and subsidies to get the equivalent result. They did it. You can do it. WTO does not like you to do it. But it can be done. Okay. So the question is finding mechanisms that allow you to offset okay, these negative aspects of being part of the international system and of relying on international, on international capital flows. Thank you. Bueno, le agradecemos al profesor Randall, digo al profesor Jan Kriegel el haber venido aquí al, al posgrado en estos días y esperamos pronto esté de nuevo. Eh, se les anuncia nuevamente que las eh, presentaciones están en la página del posgrado de la Facultad de Economía.